Vince Cable, new leader of the Liberal Democrats, just came to the podium. Let's hear from him. Friends, can I thank you for that reception? Uh, and can I thank uh, Tim and Joe for what they've just said? Um, Tim, as we've been reminded, uh, took over the leadership of the party uh, at a time of crisis. You know, he rebuilt morale, self-belief. Uh, he strengthened the idealistic core of the party. He put us at the center of the national debate about Europe. And he rebuilt our membership to record levels. And we're very indebted to him. Uh, I, inherited a par I now inherit a party which is considerably stronger than one he inherited and which now has a national reach at record levels. So, thank you, Tim. <laughs> Joe was a, an absolutely invaluable colleague at the Department of Business. We worked together for five years. Uh, and she's one of five of our Commons team who were ministers in government. And we had a comparable number in the House of Lords. And we provided what, uh, to coin a phrase, could be called strong and stable government. Uh, certainly by comparison with the two years we've had since. And in that government, um, Jo played an absolutely critical role. She was a highly effective minister, part of our team. But what she did was she piloted through important bits of legislation, shared parental leave, which tens of thousands of young parents can now take advantage of, uh, consumer protection legislation, uh, protecting pubs from the predatory practice of pub companies, and all the time dealing with quite a lot of foot dragging from our conservative coalition partners. Uh, she worked with me on pushing very hard to have women properly represented at the top of British business, getting a woman on every board of a FTSE company. And actually we succeeded, except that in the last two years, without that drive and leadership, it's gone backwards. And another of her accomplishments, and I think we tend to forget some of the things that the Lib Dems did in government. She was part of a team of Lib Dem ministers in my department. She and Ed Davey, Norman Lamb, Jenny Willett. And we inherited um, a big campaigning issue of the past, some of you remember. The post office network was collapsing. It was disintegrating. And we stopped that happening. We turned it round. By the time we'd left, it was growing. So there is a legacy of very real achievement, and I really take my hat off to Jo, who was a wonderful colleague. I know she will be an outstanding support as deputy leader of the party, and thank you very much for your comments. And I just want to make three brief points of my own. First of all, we have this gigantic space, hole, in the middle of British politics. The two major parties have been captured by ideologues, uh, ideologues on one hand who hate Europe, uh, and on the other hand who hate capitalism. And as a result, British politics is now more polarized and more divided than at any time any of us can remember. And what is now very badly missing is the basic common sense, the kind of moderation, the mutual respect that are what British politics is at its best. And my aim is that our party and I will occupy that space in British politics. Now, my second comment flows from that which relates to what is now happening around Brexit. Because I fear we're heading for a disastrous outcome. 
Uh, these negotiations are now being led by a government that is dysfunctional, it's disorganized, it's disunited. Their negotiating strategy, if we get beyond the anodyne phrase about Brexit means Brexit, was essentially based on Theresa May's Lancaster House speech, which was made at a time very different from now, when the complexities were not understood, and when she had serious political uh, authority, which has gone. And what I think will now happen is that we will be offered a combination of a good deal, a bad deal, or a, a no deal at all, crashing out of the European Union with all the costs associated with that. And the Liberal re Democrat response to this, I think, is twofold and absolutely clear. First of all, we want to work with like-minded people in other parties and non to save, to reinforce those aspects of the European project which are so important to us as a country. The first is the single market and its four freedoms. Let's not forget that this is not something that was imposed upon the UK by the European Commission. It was a British project designed by a British Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher originally, to serve British interests, including free trade in services. And then there's the customs union, which as I know because I presided over the fortunes of British manufacturing industry for five years, is absolutely fundamental to the business model of what remains, and it's often very high quality, but what remains of our manufacturing industry. And then there's the research collaboration, which is crucial to the future of our universities, and indeed very specific areas like atomic cooperation through Euratom. And then there's those areas of common ground, like dealing with global threats to the environment, the climate change, dealing with issues of international security. Those are the aspects of Europe that we must fight to keep. But I'm actually not pessimistic. That I'm not, I don't believe, actually, that, that this will be delivered. I think in practice we're faced with a much more disastrous outcome of crashing out of the European Union. And what we now need is an exit from Brexit. <laughs> and the exit from Brexit comes as a result of the policy that we have adopted, which is that we must consult the British public at the end of the process to put to them the choice, do you wish to accept what is coming down the track, jumping off a cliff and hoping that there's a tree to catch you, or do we want to stay within the European Union and making it absolutely clear that that option is still available? Now, how people decide will depend to a great deal, I think, on what's happening to the economy over the next year or two. And the outlook isn't great. I, th I think there is actually a deeper problem about the way in which the economic debate has evolved. I, I, I first got into Parliament 20 years ago, and I spent much of that time debating with people like uh, Ed Balls and Gordon Brown, um, George Osborne, Ken Clark. Now, whatever your tribal feelings, these are serious people who took economic policy seriously because they realized that economic competence determines people's living standards, determines our ability to fund our health service, our schools, our police, and the rest of it. And what has happened in the last two years is that it's gone away. You saw what happened in the general election. The Conservatives campaigned without any numbers, and the Labour Party campaigned with numbers that didn't add up. We, in turn, were praised by The Economist, by the Institutional Fiscal Studies, for our basic economic literacy and competence. 
And I believe that will resurface as an absolutely central issue. And I want us to be at the heart of all that. But in my view, the world isn't just about economics and making numbers add up. That's important. But actually, I, I came into politics as a radical and a reformer. And I want to put at the center of what I do, addressing some of the inequalities that disfigure British societies. And I think that can be done. I think it can be done because I think, at heart, the British public are humane and tolerant. And I think we can appeal to that instinct, which is in very marked contrast to the icy indifference of this Conservative government. So, to round up, I, I'm ambitious for this country, and I'm ambitious for our party. In difficult times, we've shown enormous resilience. But I now believe that we can fight our way back, break through, and make an enormous success of our party, and eventually in government. Thank you. <laughs>